choir, and then we could have discovered it a lot sooner than this. <laughs> it's been a pleasure to be with you all this week and these last few days, and I hope it's been a blessing to you. Uh, like I said last night, I always enjoy being around Brother Kenneth. He's just a cut up. I'm going to have to put up with him all these years. <laughs> stuck in there with him and uh, appreciate my friends, my preacher friends that have been coming. Brother Bob has come a couple of nights and everybody like me, Vernon and uh, Mr. Jeanette, Jeanette coming every night and now Billy Crocker. Now Billy, Billy's boy put up a garage door for me today, Billy's grandson. And if you need a garage door put up, call Billy, get his grandson. You need a garage door? Two of them. Mm -hmm. so I'm getting some business. I need to get back to this. He's a preacher boy. Good preacher. Sure. Got a church up out of, uh, what is it, Buford or up uh, Flowery oh, Range. Really and of course, it's always good to see William. And then Harold showed up tonight. Harold, one of my deacons. And I know what he come over here for just to make sure that I was going to act right. And, you know. <laughs> and the fellow with the camera told me last night that I preached 56 minutes. <laughs> huh? 51. 51 minutes. I can't believe I preached that long. It was I'm good. A short break. But anyway, <laughs> turn to the book of Jeremiah, chapter number 18. Jeremiah. Jeremiah, chapter number 18. I see a couple of fellows that said last night they might not be able to get back tonight, but they're here. Amen. And I'm glad they made it. I'm glad for anybody to go to church on Friday night. Amen. Amen. Of course, we didn't exactly start on Sunday or Monday, did we? So you're not worn out yet. You know, used to people would go to church for two weeks in a row. They'd get up. They'd feed their stock. Right. Take care of their farm. They had their crops laid by. Go to church in the morning. Stay about half the day. Come back, eat lunch, and go back at night. They'd do that for two or three weeks and never get tired. Right. Well, we do that today. We're just... We're dragging. I'm telling you, we're dragging. I know I'm dragging. I'd be dragging. Camp meat like to kill me. Our camp meat like to warm me out completely. But uh, I sure did get a blessing out of it. Amen. All right, we're going to read verses 1 through 6 of uh, Jeremiah chapter number 18. I'm sure you'll recognize this passage. Most preachers have preached on it sometime there in their, down, their, down, their, down through their ministry. And it's a passage, of course, that uh, speaks to us of God's dealing with the nation of Israel. He says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheel. And the vessel that he made, that he made of clay, was marred in his hand, in the hand of the potter. So he made it again, another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord. Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, my hand. O house of Israel. Now, of course, he goes on to say some other things, but I want to leave off the reading uh, right there, if you will. I don't just pray out your heads and pray with me. Heavenly Father, please bless tonight. Help me. God, you know that I agonized and sought your mind about what to preach tonight. And Lord... Only you know how it fits and how it meets needs, and only you know how to make it work. But I pray that you'd help me, Lord, just to give myself to you and allow you to speak through me. Enlighten me and illuminate my mind, Lord. Feed me so that I might feed these folks. Yes. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Many of you know that Jessica and I were missionaries in the country of Wales. We were there for about eight and a half years, and... When I got there, I started being introduced to some different churches around, looking for a place to minister. And I was led to meet, I was taken to meet a man named Ryden Tripp. I went up to Ryden's house. I was taken there by another preacher. And I went up to Ryden's house, and I sat there and talked with Ryden for a while. And he was a typical Welshman. He was a leader and deacon of a small Baptist church, Bethany Baptist Church in Unseer. Ryden had white hair. A little bit balding in the front and white and just calm down as close to the side. But he had a he had a he had a real white long handlebar mustache. And he kept it well trimmed and neat and he looked so much. So it looked so sweet, look, look, looked so fine. It looked like a typical Welshman. Had a deep voice with a real Welsh brogue, and he had a wife named Betty. 
Betty was just as sweet as you could be, an elegant lady, a proper lady in every sense of the word. And he and Betty had been in Bethany Baptist Church all of Ryden's life. He was now what they called the secretary of the church. His dad had been the secretary of the church. He had been the secretary himself for almost 40 years. He and Betty had kept that church going. I'm talking about when the prayer meeting got down to just two or three, Ryden and Betty were the two of the three. Amen. That's how faithful they were. Amen. And we, we, we got to know Ryden and Betty, and they became very close to us. And I, of course, went there to minister and work in that church. Well, we left Wales in June of 1997 and, uh, of course, hated to go and we felt it was the Lord's will for us at that time, so we left Wales. And then a few years later, we, uh, got, we, we began to get word that Betty was, uh, was somewhat sick and was having some heart problems. And Ryan, of course, had always been the one sick. He'd had, oh, he'd had heart surgery a couple of times, died on the operating table one time. I, everybody thought Ryan would surely die before Betty, but Betty got problems. And then on January the 6th, 2001, we got a phone call that said Miss Betty had died. And of course we were broken hearted. We knew Ryden would be broken hearted. So I, I got on the phone and I called over to Ryden's house. And there was no answer. I figured he was down at his daughter's house. He had two, two children, a boy and a girl. And he spent a lot of time down at his daughter's house. And I figured he wasn't at home. So I left Ryden a message. I left him a message, called his daughter's house later, tried to get in touch with him to comfort him. But there was no answer there. I left the message there. And in a few days, Jessica and I had, go, had to go away to a meeting somewhere. And when I came back home, there was, there, was, there, was some, there was some messages on the answering machine. And I pushed the button and listened to one. And then right his voice came on. And he said, my, and he was on his Welsh broke. He said, my dear, dear brother Rex and sister Jessica. I want to thank you for your phone calls and for your comforting. I have lost my dear Betty, but I know where she's at. <laughs> and I shall go to be with her someday soon. He said, I am broken. I am bruised. And I am battered. But I am repairable. <laughs> hey, hey. 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 I thought that's just like writing, Trip. And so tonight, I want to preach to you from this text on broken but repairable. Amen. Isn't that what we see a picture of here in these first few verses of Amen. Jeremiah chapter number 18? Yes. Amen. A nation broken, a vessel broken, but yet repairable. God led Jeremiah down to the potter's house for what you and I would call an object lesson. He said, Jeremiah, I want you to go down to the potter's house. I've got a word for you, but I can't give it to you here. I need you to see something first. Man. And so I imagine Jeremiah went down to the potter's house thinking to himself, now what is the Lord, what is the world, what in the world is the Lord going to say to me at the potter's house? Is the potter going to bring me the message? How's the message going to come to me? And so he walked into the pottery, and I don't know if you've ever been to a pottery that was a working pottery, I have. And he walked into the pottery, and there the man was sitting at the table, at the wheel, his foot on the treadle, the wheel going around, a lump of clay on the, on, on, the, on, the, on the dish, and his hands were on it, and he watched him in silence as he began to shape and mold a vessel on that wheel. Yeah. And as the vessel began to grow, Jeremiah perhaps began to recognize it. Perhaps it was going to be a, a water pitcher or some other kind of vase or some kind of bowl for eating out of or some, uh, some other vessel of storage. But Jeremiah watched as the man was working diligently and carefully and suddenly, suddenly as the man put pressure here and pressure there, suddenly the vessel collapsed under his hand. Yeah, yeah. Oh. It just collapsed. Of course, the wheel had to stop and the, and the potter had to take that, that lump of clay and, and, and knead it and beat it and, and work it again into a solid ball. Yeah. They had to go through a little, little reconstruction, a little, little demolition before some reconstruction could take place. Right. 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 Yeah. And that's what God does to us, by the way, once in a while. Sure. Right. Takes us through a little demolition project before a little reconstruction can right, take place. Right, right. And so he started the wheel up again. He sprinkled a little water on it, no doubt. And he started the wheel up again. And he began to form it into a vessel. And Jeremiah immediately recognized 
that it was not the same vessel he had had in mind before. You see, the potter had in his mind a picture of what he wanted that vessel to be. That original vessel was going to be one thing, but the second time around, the potter came up with a different plan, a different, a, a different program, and so he shaped it and fashioned it into another vessel. Amen. And then the Lord spoke to Jeremiah. He said, the word of the Lord came to me saying, yeah. O oh, house of Israel, Cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Can I, not, can I not do with you, make you and shape you and mold you into what I want you to be? He said, Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. Amen. So God gave this object lesson, and the lesson was, number one, a lesson for the nation of Israel. You see what was wrong with them? They were a rebellious people. Sure. Right. I mean, God did everything He could possibly do for them. Right. He delivered them out of the Egyptians, out of Egyptians' right. bondage. Yeah. No nation has ever had the favor of God like Israel has done, uh, like Israel has had. He's done so much for them, and yet again and again they went into sin. Yeah. Just about the time you think that they were going to reach their zenith and their glory, they're going to bring honor and glory and fulfill the calling and the, com and the, and the commission that God had for them, they would call it, go into sin, and in His hands they would collapse from the will. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Sure. Right. Over and over again, God would take them and reshape them and mold them and try to raise them up again. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like he delivered them out of bondage. He provided for them. And yet again and again, they just refused to be conformed to the image of His will. Right, right, man. How many Christians do you know? How many Christians do I know? Sure. Who have, who have been on the wheel and God was working in their life. And they were being shaped and molded and made into a vessel of usefulness and a vessel of honor. And yeah. perhaps even a vessel of beauty. Yeah, 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 yeah. Amen. Thank you, Lord. And then some point of resistance got in. Yeah. Some, some stone, of, of some flaw got in their character. And all of a sudden they collapsed. Aren't you glad tonight though that God did not like the potter, did not take that lump of clay, throw that thing away, but He just took it and He kneaded it and He beat it and He reshaped it and He started over. Sure. Oh, man. Man. God may have started over with some of you. I'm sure He had. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. That's the point. That's the thing. He said, like, you see, like this particular lump of clay, there was always some point of resistance in them. So God could never make them quite, be, quite make them into the people that He wanted them to be. You say, what did He want them to be? He wanted them to be a light to the world. He wanted Amen. them to be a witness of who He was. It was God's design and desire for Israel that through them all the nations of the earth would be blessed. He wanted them to be what. You and I are supposed sure. to be. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. He, he had a plan for them, a program for them. And though they were marred many times in his hand, still he continued to fashion them into another vessel and that he could use that would ultimately fulfill his purpose. And let me tell you something. God still has the nation of yep. Israel on the wheel tonight. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I realize there's a doctrine. I realize there's a theology out there. I realize there are those out there who think that God has cast off His former people on oh. you. But Paul said, God forbid, He's not done that. Right, right. I don't know how they can read the Bible and take get that get that uh, get that doctrine out of the Bible when we clearly see what God's doing with them in Romans 10, 11, 10 and eleven in particular, nine, ten, and eleven. And so God's ultimate. Use or plan for the nation of Israel was that they would glorify Him, yeah. magnify Him. May I say to you that just like the potter reshaped and restarted this mold, this this lump of clay on the on the wheel, God has still got His hands on the nation of Israel. Sure. Yeah. And one day they will ultimately fulfill His purpose, His plan for them. Yes, one day the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, yep. will shine with radiant splendor and rule from the throne of David in Jerusalem. All nations of the earth will go there and worship the King and the nation of Israel will be His people just like God always planned. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 
But still on a much larger scale, this is a picture of God's long suffering with the whole human race. Sure. Yeah. On the sixth day of creation, God reached down and took the dirt and dust of the earth and fashioned a perfect man. Yeah. yeah. One that would be in his own image, in his own likeness. Right. With precision and care, he saw to it that every detail was perfect. Can you imagine this perfectly formed body of a man? Laying there cold and lifeless and still on the ground. I don't know all the, well, let's say, I don't know all the medical things. I don't know if God formed him with flesh and blood inside of him. I don't know if he, I don't know if he had muscles and sinew and bone. I don't know if he was that or if he was just a lump of clay. Just like a, a potter's vessel. But God had formed him, the Bible said, out of the dust of the ground. Sure. Yeah. There was no resistance in the clay. That's right. I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, we had a place down on the creek. Mm -hmm. And up in the creek bank, there was some white clay. Sure. Yeah. Right. <laughs> we'd go down there and dig that white clay out. Yeah. And we'd take it and make little plates and little stuff out of it, little dishes out of it. But almost always there was some stone or some little rock in there or some little hard piece of clay. And when you tried to shape it, you couldn't shape it because it was resistant to your hand. So you had to take that out. Yeah. But when God formed Adam out of the dust of the ground, there was no resistance there. There was no lumps of rebellion to be found anywhere. No stones of indifference were left anywhere in that body. Then I can almost see God pause as he looks into the future and he sees the wickedness of man, he sees the price that his own dear son would one day have to pay Here, right. for man's redemption. Yeah. He saw man broken by sin, diseased by fleshly lust. He saw us wayward, wicked, rebellious, and ruined. He saw us battered. Right. He saw us bruised and broken, but praise His name, He also saw us as repairable. Yeah. Some things are beyond repair for us, but they're not beyond God's repair. Sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Amen. So He drew a gentle breath. And He blew into that lifeless form the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Sure. Wow. Formed like clay or a potter's wheel. Yeah. Out of the dust and the dirt and the ground. And oh, what sweet fellowship God had with man. Sure. As they walked in the garden in the cool of the day with yeah. nothing between them. Yeah. Nothing to hide. Right. No lumps, no rebellion, nothing. Right. Until one day, sin, by deception of Eve and through Adam and Eve, sin came into the world. Right. But yet God had a plan for our salvation. Hey, yes, He did. From the very foundation of the world, He would give His own dear Son to repair and to restore that which was broken. That broken fellowship that man once had is restored through the witness of, and through the work of Calvary. Right, right. And did you know, until you are hardened by the fire, yeah. there is hope for you. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now listen. The wheel don't the, the, the vessel don't go straight from the wheel to the fire. Mm -hmm. no. Down at the potter's house, Jeremiah would have seen not only the man working at the wheel, but he would have seen the racks that were there and the shelving that was there with vessels that had been already formed, mm -hmm. but they had not yet been glazed in fire. Right. Sure. So there was the drying racks. Mm -hmm. And until you've been just dried up. <laughs> Until you've yeah. been through the fire, yeah. there's still hope for you. Sure. Right. Yeah. Right. God doesn't give up on us right. like yeah. men do. Right. 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 And so you, sir, you, madam, you, young person, may, you may be far away from God, you may be lost without peace today, but 
you're not without hope. Amen. You may be a Christian and yet you may be backslidden and, and, and struggling in your Christian walk, but you're not without hope because God still has His hand on you. Amen. 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 If you'll call, call on Him, if you'll yield to Him, yeah. uh, yes. no matter what you might have been, I may not be today because of the rebellion in my life, but I might have been. Right, right. But thank God He made me another vessel. Here. Amen. Amen. And I have known many, many people who have their lives have been marred by sin through through wickedness or divorce or, or drug addiction or alcoholism. Yes, sure. And yet God did not take His hand yes. off of them. God had a vision for their life. And though He could not make them into what He initially intended, yet when they crumbled and fell and they allowed Him to mold them, they made, He made them into something better. Right. Yeah. 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 Sure. It's a vessel that seemed good to the potter to make it. Right. You know, we want to make everybody fit a mold of our own. Right. Yeah. You know, we want cookie cutter Christians. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> right. we, we really do. Mm -hmm. okay. We want everybody to look look right and right. spit white. Sure. <laughs> That's, That's what we a good point. and smell right and all the good stuff to go with it. Right. <laughs> wow. I had a little boy over in Wales. He got saved. Showed up at my church. I had nothing to do with getting him saved. I can't remember his name, but he had raven hair, black as coal, down to his waist. I mean, that boy, he had the hair, and the women just thought he was absolute. I mean, tell you the truth, they loved him. <laughs> Betty Tripp especially loved him. <laughs> but he got on fire for God, and he's telling everybody in the world he could tell about Jesus. He came into my youth meetings, wanted to work with young people, so he came in for a few weeks of working. And that, that, that hair just bothered me. <laughs> it bothered you too, wouldn't it? And then your rings bother you too, don't they? That's why you leave yours at home, ain't it? <laughs> and I was praying one day, and I said, Lord, I am not going to tell him to get his hair cut. You want him to get his hair cut? You tell him. Sure. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. And I'm telling you the truth before God Almighty, he showed up that Friday night with a haircut yeah. just like we. Yes, sir. Yeah. 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 He can do it. Amen. You remember that, don't you, Jesse? Didn't recognize. Didn't recognize. Handsome man. I mean, a handsome dude. And, uh, and, and the next Sunday morning, Betty Tripp said, said, Oh, no, you cut off your hair. <laughs> <laughs> he, went off, he went off to college in London, met up with a good Christian girl, got married years later, sent me an email, reminded me of taking me to all we've done for him. But you know what I learned? I learned a valuable lesson. God is the one who's got him. Yes. God is the one who right. right. God is the one who yes. changes people. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. We can get people to conform. Sure. Right. And, and, and sometimes people do need to conform. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. I mean, if people are, if a woman's wanting to wear a bikini to church, she needs to conform. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah man. Sure. <laughs> so, never mind, I won't get on that. <laughs> I mean, tell you, that some churches got blankets. Yep. You know, yeah, come on. And it's and it's not just for those who fall out on the floor, I think. Amen. Yeah, come on. But people ought to dress right, go to church right. I don't want to get off on all that, but what I'm saying is, God is the one who moves. Yep. Yeah, man. Right. We expect people to be we we somehow know got in our mind that everybody ought to be cut out of the same piece of cloth. Right, right. But the truth of the matter is, we've all come from different backgrounds. Sure. Different genes flow right. through our at work, our lives, and we're active in our body. Our mindset is different. Our makeup is different. Everything that we've experienced through life has made us what we are. Yep. And only God can make us what yes. we are to be. Yes, sir. Right. Amen. Yeah. Right. Sure. So, this is... A picture of the whole human race. Right. Yeah, right. Right. Marred by sin. <coughs> Why did God create Adam and Eve? Why did He create them? 
to have fellowship with him. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was something about it. He, he, he had the angels of glory. He had his own precious son and the Holy Spirit. But yet there was a different, there was a missing part or there was a longing in his heart. And so he created a man. Wow. A man that could willfully and wonderfully worship him and love him out of a true heart. Amen. But sin marred that. We must realize today that sinners are not just sinners, they're broken sinners. Dear God. They're broken people. Right, they right. Are. They are. Most of the people who come through the doors of Galilean Baptist Church, they are broken people from some 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 mass they've been in. Our church in, in Vernon and Jeanette, Jeanette would we call this, our church has long been a place of rescue for broken people. Sure. Amen. Okay. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yes, sir. Hospital for sinners. Broken but, say it with me, repairable. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Broken but fixable. Yeah. Right. Now there are some things once in a while that might get broke that you've been working on like an old bicycle or an old car that you just can't fix. <laughs> but that God's never run across a case like that yet. No, no, so it's a picture of the nation of Israel. It's a picture in a large sense of the whole human race. But not only that, in a very personal way, you and I can see ourselves as Amen. this lump of clay. Yeah. Amen. My personal testimony is too long to tell the details. But I grew up in a farm, on, a, in, on a chicken farm. I'm number 10 out of 14 kids. All right. By the time I came along, my daddy was already a backslidden Baptist preacher. Oh. Ordained in 1950, out of the ministry by 1952. Never went to church a day and Sunday in my life as far as I can remember when I was growing up. But he told us, he made us told the line and kept us straight and all that sort of stuff. But by the time I was 11, 12 years old, I was into all kinds of meanness. I mean, I was into all kinds of meanness. For a 10, 11, 12 year old, I was really into the big stuff, like cussing and stealing and smoking. Even if it was just rabbit tobacco, I smoked. I mean, for 11, 12 year old, I was into the heavy stuff. But along came a man named Tommy Kirkendall who gathered up a group of boys out of our neighborhood to have a boys' Sunday school class. He took me to church. And for one solid year, I never missed Sunday school or church. Amen. And in that year, I, got, I, heard some of the, I, I heard probably some of the greatest anointed preaching you ever heard in your life. I'd hear old men pray under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Yep. And I mean, they'd bring the rafters. Here. I mean, I, I'd sit there and listen to it and think they never was going to stop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It seemed they never were anyway. But I remember seeing old Sherry McGarry preach until his face got so red and he, run, he could rain sweat out of his shirt tail. Yeah, man. One Sunday morning, sitting over in the corner, I got under conviction and I, when I came to myself, I was in tears. I went to the altar. I cried out to God. I got up and made perfection of faith that God had saved me. And I went on from there with the Lord just went out of that building that day, felt as light as a feather, felt like the world had changed around me, and everything was different. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Amen. I had a job in a gas station, working in a gas station, pumping gas and fetching bait for bait and tackle. <coughs> then when I turned 15, I got the job down in Marietta, working it with my brother-in-law, and boy, things started going downhill from there. I got involved with a guy from West Virginia named Tommy. Tommy liked the drinking, Tommy liked the party, and Rex got in the party and drinking mode with Tommy. Mm -hmm. The next thing you know, I get into this and into that. And to make a long story short, shortly after I turned 16, I came in one night, smarted off to my mother. And when I did, my daddy went ballistic. His eyes fogged up. He jumped me. Started beating the devil out of me. I tried to fight him off. Get away from him. He kept coming after me relentlessly. I went into my back into my bedroom and I had two hunting arrows up on my book, on my gun rack. 
had broad blade hunting, hunting arrow heads on them, broad heads on them. Mm. He grabbed those things and went after me. My brother David grabbed him from behind, pinned his arms against him like that. He broke those arrows over his knees and flew them to the floor, slung my brother off, picked up a claw hammer and swung it at me and caught me right under the nose. Uh. I went out in the yard trying to get away from him. By this time I'm in tears. I'm pleading with him to stop. He's got my He's got my compound bow in his hand. He's swinging that at me. I pick up a piece of pipe about nine or ten feet long, galvanized pipe. I hold him off with it. And I'm begging, begging him to stop. And finally, I throw that. He throws the bow at me. I throw the pipe down, pick up the bow, and take off. Sixteen years old in a few months. Where am I going to go? What am I going to do? I'd spend a few nights with some of my friends, and then move in with my sister. And for, the over the next, for more than the next two years, two and a half years, I never speak to my dad. I, look, I drive by the house and make sure his truck was gone before I'd stop and go in and see my mother. I'd go to school and work and keep myself going and pay my sister a little rent and try my best. But I'm going to tell you, those are some of the worst years of my life. Hey, sure. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Jessica and I got married and we trying to get right with God and going to church and doing this and that and trying to do better. One Monday morning I was at work on a Memorial Day. The phone rang and it said my youngest brother had been in a motorcycle accident. He was in the hospital and wasn't expected to leave. Mm -hmm. My brother jumped in the truck, took off to the hospital and found my daddy sitting there at the hospital in the wrong hospital. They take him to a different hospital. I went out and sat down on the curb and I promised God if he had let my brother live, I'd, I'd do anything he wanted me to do. Amen. And I prayed and prayed and I gave up my cigarettes and I gave up this and I gave up that. And finally I said, God, live or die, I'll do what you want me to do. Sure. Amen. Amen. A few hours passed and that afternoon the word came that he was gone. He, he was gone. We brought the body home. He laid in the living room. In the casting family, people came to visit him home. I walked in there one day and I looked at my brother and suddenly I melted. I lost it. I lost it. My emotion, every ounce of emotion that was in me just drained out of me. Yeah. I went back to my old bedroom, threw myself on my bed, and I began to squall uncontrollably. Finally, I was broken. Finally, I was broken. We, my dad and I have sort of unofficially patched things up, but I remember that afternoon that my brother died. We were walking out in the barn, out to the shed, and there laid that hammer that daddy had swung at me with, one just like it. It was Glenn, my brother. He picked it up and he began to cry. And for the first time in my life, I put my arms around my daddy, told him that I loved him. Amen. 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 Good repairs. God knows how to break you. Sure, he does. Yeah. 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 Yes, sir. Yes, he does. Six months later, it's New Year's Eve. Jessica's asleep on the couch. She can never stay up past nine o'clock. <laughs> I'm in the back bedroom of that little old trailer. I'm down on my knees. I'm trying to get saved. I'm telling God I need to get saved. I'm begging God to save me. I can't get any peace. Finally, I say, Lord, if you want me to preach, I'll preach. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I say, but you'll have to confirm it. And I opened up my Bible and I began to flip through it. I fell on a verse in the book of Acts. It said, and they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Yeah, I went down to the church where some of us young guys was meeting for a midnight prayer meeting. And I got up and preached my first little sermon and confessed my call to preach. Save. Save. I'm telling you, You may be broken. You may be bruised. 
You may be terribly, terribly bad, but God can repair you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. You say, oh, you just don't know the terrible life that I've lived. No, but God does. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah.
they're willing for you to make them another vessel according to your will and purposes. I pray they'll come and submit, submit themselves and surrender themselves in this invitation to yeah. And God, there might be somebody here today that they identify with what I've said about my own self. And they might just want to bow their head and say, Thank you, Lord. Thank you for not throwing me away. Amen. Thank you. I pray for this church, Brother Kenneth, for his staff, for his dear wife. I pray that come this Lord's Day, Lord, that you'll bless them with visitors, but most of all, that you would visit them yourself. Fill this place with your power, presence, your love. Lord, may you continue to bless Trinity Hill Baptist Church. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity I've had to come this week and be a little part of their ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.